Good morning! 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 Good morning!
will be represented by three states. They will be drawing an idea of their Irishness from across the North. For some of them, this will be their last battle. For some of them, it will be their first battle. For some of them, it will be their first battle with the Irish Brigade. 116 Pennsylvania has never been in a battle before. Today will be their initiation. The 28th Massachusetts are seasoned veterans. <clears throat> but at Fredericksburg, for the first time, they line up with the Irish Brigade. They were an Irish unit that was supposed to be with this brigade from its inception. But government bureaucracy misplaced them and then decided to substitute them with the 29th Massachusetts, a down east Pilgrim Pride type of regiment, not exactly Irish. <laughs> they changed that in the fall of 1862, and they lined up for the first time with the Irish Brigade. The Irish Brigade is commanded by a Brigadier General named Thomas Francis Maher. Maher was an Irish revolutionary in the 1840s who was banished from Ireland, sent to Tasmania, and then escaped to the United States and became the voice of Irish Americans and the leader of the Irish Brigade. He was a gifted man with words. He was an orator. He was a writer. And that <clears throat> gave him a certain mystique that the men looked to him for direction, for leadership. He has made it a point of drawing distinction to them. On the battlefield, the Irish Brigade was always easy to find because they had green flags. The emerald flags flew over all the battlefields of the Eastern Theater of the War. But when we came to Fredericksburg, we were in a unique circumstance. It was winter time, a time of rest and recuperation, refitting, and reflection. It was not a time ordinarily <laughs> set aside for battle. But the war had taken a turn, and it was vital that the Union Army move forward and achieve victory this winter before the Emancipation Proclamation is signed on January 1st, 1863. The Irish Brigade didn't know that. They thought they were going into winter camp. They were going to lick their wounds, fill their ranks, and retire their colors to get new ones that weren't rent by battle, torn by shot and shell. So the New York regiments sent their flags home, <laughs> expecting momentarily to have new flags arrived from Tiffany. There was no green flag among the old scale works of the Irish Brigade. In fact, in the entire brigade, the only green standard was with the 28th Massachusetts because they just joined the brigade. They just got their flag and it was in great shape. As a result, when General Maher lines up his men for battle on December 13th, he deliberately puts the 28th Massachusetts dead center in his line so that their flag will be the flag of all of them. But 1,250 men in the chaos and confusion of battle, will they be able to always see the one flag? Will they always be able to identify the whole group by that one flag? <clears throat> General Maher, 
did not think that did it. He needed something else to distinguish the Irish soldiers on this battlefield. And he came up with a happy idea. He took two of his staff officers and he disappeared momentarily and went into some local garden and picked boxwood. They picked bundles of boxwood and they brought it back to the brigade. And General Maher stood here where we stand and addressed his men and said, today, Foxwood would be your green symbol of your Irishness taken from an American garden, your Americanism. This is your combination. This is your identity. And every man in the brigade should have a sprig of boxwood to put into their hat. The brigade commander set the tone by taking three large bowels and stuffing them in his hat band. They started handing it out to every member of the brigade. And they all took to it with a great deal of excitement. They not only filled their hats, some of them made wreaths for their flags. Some of them stuffed it in their collars and in their buttonholes. And a sergeant major named Samuel Hunter said to look down the ranks of the Irish Brigade was like looking at a living, breathing shrub. <laughs> <clears throat> the men were enthusiastic, to say the least. William McClellan, 88th New York Infantry, wrote about being here at this time. He said at 12 o'clock, we were drawn up in the line, and the general gave us each a sprig of evergreen to put it in our caps. We all looked gay, and we felt in high spirits. Little dreaming, though we expected a heavy battle, that in so short a time, so many of our poor fellows would be sent to their final doom. Officers were grave because they knew what would follow. But the men in the ranks were cheerful, hopeful, optimistic because they thought their leaders had a plan and that they would overcome them. No matter what the Confederates beyond the city would throw at them. General Maher then went down the ranks of the Irish Brigade going through the five separate regiments and talking to each one individually to let them know what they should expect from the battlefield and from him and what he would expect of them. Some of the local civilians who had hunkered down in the cellars of their homes were lured out to hear the elocution of Thomas Francis Maher. Some of them were even reported in the newspaper shortly after this battle. A correspondent wrote, and Maher addressed his men in a florid, highfalutin speech. He told them that the hill beyond the town, Marie's height, had to be stored, and that they were the boys to do it. He reminded them of the gallant deed of the son of Aaron on all the celebrated battlefields from Waterloo to Williamsburg and wound up with an glorious apostrophe to the star-spangled banner to which every member of the brigade responded with three loud cheers. As he went down the line, 
He pretty much gave the same gist of those speeches five times. But at the same time, he tailored himself to each individual regiment to personalize it, to look after them. He told the 116th Pennsylvania that this battle will be your first battle. And as a result, I will stick close to you. You will stick close to me. I want to see the American flag on top of Marie's Heights. And I want to see that green flag right there with it. With the 88th New York, we gave a longer speech. For us, we've been very fortunate that one of the soldiers wrote it down, almost verbatim. You want to hear the voice of a general talking to his men just before he leads them to their death. Thomas Francis Maher standing right here. Our regiment was second in line. When the general reached the colors of our regiment, he uncovered his head. The division commander, General Winfield Scott Hancock, stood behind him. The general then spoke up. Officers and soldiers of the 88th Regiment, in a few minutes, you will be engaged with the enemy in the most terrible battle, which will probably decide the fate of this glorious, great, and grand country, the home of your adoption. Then he paused. The writer thought he wiped a tear out of his eye. And then he spoke again. Soldier, this is my own, this is my wife's own regiment. She is your patron. Her own dear 88, she calls it. And I know, and I have confidence, that with dear woman smiles upon you, and for woman's sake, that this day, you will strike a deadly blow and bring back to this distracted country its former prestige and glory. This may be my last speech to you, but I will be with you in battle. And I will be with you in battle at its fiercest. And if I fall, I did my duty. And I felt fighting in the most glorious of causes. Did the general promise success? Did he promise victory? He did not. Does he expect success? Does he expect victory? He does not. The battle on this part of the battlefield never, ever, gave the Union Army any chance of success. On the southern end of the battlefield, five miles below us, the Union Army is scheduled to make a breakthrough. But on the north end of the battlefield, there is nothing for the Union Army to gain victory. But they're still going to attack. They must attack because they have to keep the Confederates in front of us busy. If they keep them occupied, they will not be bled off to the south end of the battlefield. We will isolate the southern end of the battlefield for the Union Army. The blood sacrifice at this end of the battlefield will be for someone else's victory. Union soldiers 
are expected to go forward at midday. At 11 o'clock in the morning, Union soldiers are already starting out of the city and attacking the Confederates and failing. William Frenchman's division literally marched right past us. He went up a rocky lane and attacked the Confederates. In about 35 minutes, one in every four Union soldiers has been gunned down. Where French fails, Hancock must pick up the slack. Among Hancock's troops are three brigades. One led by Colonel Samuel Kosciusko Duck. And one led by a brigadier general named John C. Caldwell. And a third, Maher's Irish Brigade. Sook's Brigade will go first. They will march right past the Irish Brigade and go out the Rocky Lane. And they will fare no better. The Confederates have zeroed in on the exit route on the south end of the city. Their cannon play on the street, literally as troops march up in column. And it's like bowling through their ranks. Will the Irish Brigade follow them? General Hancock sees that this is a futile gesture, made even worse. So he's going to come at it from a different angle. We're going to move up through the center of the city. We're going to use the cover of the houses. And we're going to go out a different route that the Confederates have not already zeroed in. And perhaps that might make the difference between all the attacks that went before us and failed. Maybe, just maybe, the Irish Brigade can achieve just a little bit more. This place is very important to the Irish Brigade. This is the last time that they would stand together. This is the first time that they will wear boxwood together. When this day is over, the ranks diminished. Boxwood would have fallen among the very closest of the Union soldiers to that Confederate stone wall. <clears throat> so in remembrance of this place where they gathered for the last time, a monument has been erected to the honor of these five regiments. It is a place where we gather and remember them and before we follow their footsteps, we will commemorate their experience.